I'm the vicar at St. John's Church in Columbus. Exodus is a story of community, an oppressed, enslaved community led to freedom. It's a community chosen by God with the people's relationship to God sealed with a covenant, the promise of God's continuing presence with the chosen people. As the people journey to the promised land, they're bound together by God's gift of the law and commanded to worship the one true God. I see three major themes in the book of Exodus. Liberation, the law and covenant, and worship. Each of these movements in the story is a story of community building with implications for our church today as we intersect with the larger community around us. First, liberation. God led the Hebrew people out of bondage to the corrupt powers of this world toward freedom under the sovereign rule of God. Pharaoh had used and abused the people for his own glory, for his own economic gain. He forced them into hard labor for his own benefit. But it was God, not Pharaoh, who had the last word. God broke the bonds of slavery and freed the people through Moses. The Exodus story stands as a sign of hope to people today who are enslaved by the systems of this world. Now, in our context, we may not be poor or oppressed, but we are all held in bondage by the gods, small g, of our economic, social, and political systems. We answer to the gods of wealth and of privilege that break our relationship with God and with each other. I enjoy a certain amount of privilege solely based on the color of my skin, on the social and economic background of my family, on the degrees I hold, on my position as a leader in the church. I can be relatively confident that if I'm stopped by the police, they will listen to me respectfully. I'm free to roam through stores, taking my time to examine and, and touch any item I wish, pretty confident that I won't be followed. I can live on, in almost any neighborhood I want to, Certainly others hold more privilege than I do, but far more enjoy much less. And as long as any are held in bondage by a corrupted system, we are all held in bondage. Did we create the system? No. But as God's chosen people, who promise at our baptisms to strive for justice and peace and to respect the dignity of every human being, we're all called to break the bonds of oppression and journey toward the promised land of God's intentions for the world. The liberation of the poor and the oppressed depends on confession of and atonement for our sins both personal and corporate. The goal of liberation in the Exodus and now is right relationship with God in order to build up and redeem the whole community. So, if the system is broken, if we're all held in bondage, what do we do about it? Which brings us to our second theme, the law and the covenant. God gave the law as a gift to the people to enable them to live in right relationship with God and with one another. The law gives order to the community according to God's rule, not the world's. 
thriving communities are built on the foundation of order, of right relationship, summed up by Jesus in the Great Commission to love God with all our hearts and our minds and our souls and to love our neighbors as ourselves. If we do that, the world will be returned to God's intentions. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Just follow the law to love God and love neighbors and everything will be all right. But of course, we all know that it's not that simple. So where do we begin? I would suggest that one of the major barriers to community building is that we don't know our neighbors. How many of you come to church on Sunday morning, park in the parking lot, go into the worship, leave the church, and never have any direct relationship or direct contact with any of your neighbors? Many of you know of the old custom of beating the bounds of a parish. It's a medieval practice, and it's still practiced in some Anglican and Episcopal congregations. It's based on the idea of parish as a geographical area. The priest leaves the congregation around, beating markers to indicate the boundaries of the parish. He uses a stick made of reeds. The assumption is that the parish is much larger than the ground upon which the church is built. It includes a whole village or a whole county. Everyone and everything is part of the parish and it's under the pastoral care of the priest. What if we thought of our parishes as encompassing whole neighborhoods? What if we thought of everyone in a certain circumference of the church building as part of us? part of our congregation, benefiting from the same pastoral care and spiritual nurture that we enjoy. Exodus beckons us to get to know our neighbors, to go out and to build meaningful relationships, not as a way to increase our membership, but as a way to return us to God's intentions for our communities liberating us from that which divides and separates us from one another. Our failure to build relationships with the broader community grants lordship to the powers of this world, to our pharaohs. Being an integral part of a whole community builds our relationships with God and with one another and recognizes the sovereignty of God. The first step in this kind of community building is to get to know our neighbors. Who lives in, works in, or passes through your church neighborhood? Who lives right across the street or around the corner? What does the neighborhood around your church offer people in terms of resources? Are there schools, stores? cultural and recreational resources, health care facilities, other religious institutions? And who are the people who staff these resources? Well, how are we going to find out the answers to these questions? Leaving the, com the comfort of our church buildings and our church friends is our starting point wandering in the desert on the way to the promised land serves as an apt metaphor. We must leave the familiar to discover the gifts around us. A useful technique is asset-based community development. ABCD maps the people and resources in a community. Decide on the geographical area that you consider your parish and then go out to learn about the people and places in your community and begin to build relationships. Through observations and interviews, the assets of any community can be mapped. 
We can find out exactly who and what the strengths and limitations are. But most importantly, we, beginning, we begin to develop those ongoing relationships with our neighbors. No longer is it the greenhouse down the street, but it's the Smith's home. Mr. Smith works in IT, and he's a youth soccer coach. Mrs. Smith sells commercial real estate, and they have two children, a high schooler and a middle schooler, who also enjoy soccer. And the diner down the street is no longer simply Joe's, but it's a network of people, the servers, the cooks, the other staff in the restaurant, who all have families, who all have outside interests, personal strengths, and challenges. None of Joe's workers can afford to live in the neighborhood around the church building, and many of them take the bus to work. Were you aware that the nearest bus stop is six blocks away from Joe's Diner? Getting to know our neighbors, celebrating all our gifts together, sharing our hopes and our dreams and our struggles is what it means to be community. It's what it means to be the church. Being the church also involves, indeed is centered on, worship our third theme in Exodus. Liberated from slavery in the service of Pharaoh, given the gift of law to bind the people to God and to one another, the Hebrew people were called to worship. Not to worship the golden calf that they crafted for themselves, but the one true God. Following the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, they were immersed in praise and worship. What can we learn from the Hebrew people who were first freed from slavery, then freed from the false gods of this world? When we think of worship, we usually think of buildings, places to go by choice, to worship in a way that free feeds our spiritual hunger. Now we pay lip service to the church is the people and not the building. Let's not kid ourselves. Our buildings are very precious to us. They may be where we experience the presence of God most profoundly. But they may also shut us off and segregate us into small gatherings of like-minded individuals. We may miss the beauty of other aspects of God's creation because we can't see beyond our stained glass windows. And let's be honest, fewer and fewer people are coming into our church buildings. We're becoming more and more cut off from the larger community. So what if, instead of waiting for people to come to us, we went out to the people. Our asset maps will confirm where people are, who they are, and what they're doing. Like the tabernacle that the Hebrew people followed, through that desert, we can follow the cross of Christ into our streets. At St. John's, our second service every Sunday is Street Church. Our worship space is a vacant lot. Our altar, a card table. Street Church is the larger of our two services. Our members are anyone who happens by each week. Some living on the streets, some living in houses nearby, and some just passing through. We do have many devoted members who have come every week for years to pray, to hear God's word, and to share Eucharist. There is no reason that street church has to be located in poor neighborhoods. 
we developed the service because we knew that many of our friends don't feel comfortable coming into the church building. Perhaps some of the people that are not in your pews on Sunday mornings don't feel comfortable inside church buildings either. Or perhaps they're gathering elsewhere, on soccer fields or in coffee shops, at community festivals or in college campuses. Why not take the church to them instead of waiting for them to come to church? We cannot assume that people who do not come to church do not have the same spiritual hunger that we do. They just haven't found a way to connect to our communities. We can be a bridge. We can also think more broadly about what the church offers to people. We're very good at reaching out to the poor in communities, often far away from our churches. But are we reaching out to our neighbors close to home? People who are just as much in need of prayer, spiritual nurture, and relationship in a community of faith. What about offering prayer as people move through their days? In addition to having a booth at a community festival to raise money for the church, why not offer prayer? We installed prayer stations in our butterfly gardens so that people can walk through the garden, say a prayer, read a psalm or a short passage from scripture. Throughout the day, we watch as people stop, reflect, and give thanks to God. A number of churches are offering ashes to go on Ash Wednesday or prayers out on street corners. Who knows how God will act in the lives of others because they have heard a short passage of scripture or shared a prayer or held a friendly opinion. The point is, the people of the Exodus did not wait 40 years to pray and worship just because they were traveling through the desert and didn't have a building to go to. Every day was a worship event, every step a recognition that God led the way to the Promised Land. They didn't need a building to worship, and neither do we. We love our buildings, but we must face the reality that the church really is not the one. The church is really us. The us that reaches out far beyond the property that's right around the church building and encompasses the whole beloved community of God. Exodus, a journey from that which enslaves to that which frees. A journey toward God's promise of community. A journey founded on worship and praise of the one true God. A journey that challenges us to build community that will take us into the future. Go out to love and serve the Lord.